Today on the podcast, we have a special guest for you guys today. He's someone who has played at a very high level in professional sports. He is someone who is now on a very high level in the business industry, working in real estate. He's someone that we could all learn from, someone who has been a mentor to me who I've learned from as well. His name is Yannick Cujo Virgil. He's a real estate investor and founder of Maryland Acquisitions, former outside linebacker for the Tennessee Titans, and a local University of Maryland graduate. Welcome to the podcast, Yannick. Uh, thanks so much, Ivory. Thanks for having me on the show. Yes, sir. If you guys are listening to this and aren't watching this, he, he's, he's dressed up pretty dapper. I got my, my <laughs> University of Rhode Island gear on, but I'm, I'm actually at University of Maryland where, where Yannick went. So, But no, Yannick, so walk me through your football journey, right? And you don't have to take me all the way back, but like, how did you end up in the NFL? And I know yeah. you went to Seton and then you walked on to UMD. I mean, what was that journey like for you after high school of, of making it to the league? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and first and foremost, thanks for allowing me to share my story. So um, journey to the NFL, it was definitely a bumpy journey, you know, starting off in high school, being called a waste of space by okay. um, my ninth grade quarterback. You know, I wasn't Holy that shit. good in football. And, um, you know, just started working really hard, going to the weight room, training hard, working on Fridays when everyone was going home, uh, dedicating my life to the sport of football. Uh, that really propelled me to a different level um, as far as athletic development. Um, and, you know, in high school, I really wasn't heavily recruited. Um, actually, I had no stars and, uh, you know, went to Division Two because they, that was quite frankly, the largest scholarship offer that I was offered. Really? Got passed up on a lot of Division One double A's and, um, you know, D1 schools. Uh, so went there, uh, you know, we weren't that good. I hate losing. You know, if I'm working hard and I'm dedicating everything that I have, I want the same uh, for my teammates. So I decided to transfer to Maryland, quite frankly, because I said, hey, you know, I, I know that I can play at the at the Division One level. And um, this is... I can't live the rest of my life knowing that if I didn't take the chance, um, what would my life uh, turn out to be? So decided to give up my scholarship. Definitely risky. You know, anyone that's given up a scholarship is probably crazy. Yep. Um, but that's what I wanted to do. Right. Because I knew that I believed in myself and I knew that if given the opportunity, I can show the, co the coaches that I can earn a scholarship. So it worked out pretty well. It took me about a semester to get a full scholarship. And wow. from there, uh, you know, kept working hard, started getting some accolades, uh, landed in at the Tennessee Titans. And, you know, it was a dream of mine to play in the NFL. You know, anyone I think that's playing Pop Warner or high school football has some sort of dream of of making it to the NFL. Unfortunately, I had a knee injury and it was one of those things where you never really think that an injury is a way that would end your entire, you know, life or um, not entire life, but everything that you've worked for, your, 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 your dreams, your hopes, and your goals to play a long time in the NFL. Uh, but for me, I think the transition was, was, was somewhat challenging um, because I didn't necessarily know exactly what I wanted to do. Hmm. But fortunately, I, I picked, up the, picked up a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like everyone in real estate, right? Um, and I, I read something that said in the book, it said, you know, it's not how much you make it's about how much you keep. Mm. And at the same time, I was out just partying with guys that I've played, spending a lot of money, going to Miami, you know, all the trips that folks do in the NFL. And I said, man, you know, I've amassed a amount of money that quite frankly, you know, no one in my family has amassed in such a short amount of time. I'm not going to blow it. And so mm. I wanted to make sure that I had something to leave with um, after I played in the NFL. And I found that real estate was a great opportunity. So fast forward, jumped into the world of real estate and, you know, I've been running ever since. Hmm. No, that was swift answer there, Yannick. I kind of want to back it up there. Um, so I think you mentioned this to me, but you're first generation, right? Yeah. Yep. So your parents were born, I believe in Trinidad. Of, Trinidad. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. So I was born in Trinidad as well. My mom and dad, yeah as is from Trinidad. And um, yeah, so first generation kind of American, you know, uh, 
in migration, you know, so to speak. So all of my family, for the most part, is still back home in Trinidad. So I, I don't believe they're playing uh, football in Trinidad. They're playing football, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're <laughs> so playing who, soccer. Yeah, American put, football is what I've been playing. Who who put the pigskin in front of you? Like, how did you get introduced to football? And was it, I feel like a lot of times you're a big dude, right? What's your six, six, yeah, three, six, two, six. Well, six. Yeah, around six, three. Um, you know, 250 right now. <laughs> Got you. So was it one of those things where like coaches saw you in middle school or high school and they were like, you should play football or was it where you led to it on your own? Honestly, it was just one of those things where, you know, you, you kind of get Americanized, you know, coming to the U S at a young age and you see other kids kind of throwing the football in, in the schoolyard and you kind of just, you know, fall, fall in love with the game. So it's not like I had, you know, I had, a, I had a crazy growth spurt, um, ninth grade. I went from like, uh, five, seven, a buck 35 to like six feet, you know, Damn. 175 and in going into the 10th grade. So I had a Damn. crazy growth spurt, like <laughs> ninth grade going into 10th grade. And, um, you know, ever since then, I've just kind of been adding to the frame. So wow. I think that's, uh, that's kind of how I was, you know, I developed in the football space as well. Gotcha. I saw that you were a, a preseason selection for the for the Buckus Award, right? And that's the most prestigious college award for linebackers, I believe, right? And in, in, in college football, and your yeah. preseason selection, you know, obviously, and I don't want to gloss over this fact, but I feel like, you know, there's naturally gifted players, right? And I feel like every anybody who makes it to the NFL is is naturally gifted, right? Some are more naturally gifted than other people, but then I feel like what what also can you have that, you know, can close that gap as well is work ethic, right? And I remember when I spoke to you on the phone and I asked you how you got into real estate, you said, hey, all that work ethic that I have for football, I applied it to real estate. Like I just transferred that passion into real estate. So I'm curious to know what that work ethic was for you in football. Like talk to me about that nitty gritty, like what truly separated you from 99% 99% of the college guys that don't make it to the league, right? Could you kind of touch on that work ethic? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the biggest thing is just um, having that never die attitude, right? Um, you know, in, in, in sports, you know, I've, I've never been the, the guy to have the the large, you know, mes- the, the best measurables, right? I never re- was like super fast in the 40 or um, super quick, um, but I had the work ethic. I had the will to outwork someone, you know? Um, and, you know, using that willpower and that perseverance power and transitioning that into the real estate space, um, you know, I didn't have a degree in business or finance. You know, I went to school for kinesiology. I thought that I was going to play in the NFL for 10 years, start your you own know, gym. build a gym, yeah. and then retire, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there were, there were a lot of times where I tried to get different jobs and, you know, I was told, hey, you don't have anything on your resume. Um, you know, you're not qualified. Um, I just use the work ethic and perseverance of just meeting different people, shaking different hands, going on YouTube University, Google University to kind of close that gap. Because the reality is that everything that you need to learn, 90% of that is online somewhere, Hmm. right? And I just took the mentality, like, you only need one shot. You say say it all the time in the NFL and sports in general. You just need one person to give you an opportunity, right? If someone goes down with an injury, it's your time. That's your opportunity. Right. And so I wanted to make sure that I was prepared for my opportunity. And so by doing that, I had to uh, prepare for, by just learning things about real estate, learning about finance, changing my um, whatever mindset that I had prior to getting into the real estate from a mm. finance perspective. And just understanding that um, you have to be ready when your opportunity comes. Mm. So, you know, using that mindset. Uh, allowed me to really network and find people until I found someone to give me a shot for an asset management position and then learned asset management by joining his firm, moved to different firms, learned and learned and learned, and then jumped out and did my own thing. Hmm. So I think, you know, the, the biggest story behind that is that, you know, education for one is the greatest equalizer, right? Hmm. And if you're willing to put in the work and you're willing to dedicate time and energy to building a craft and bettering yourself i think that there's no limits to where you can really go you just have to Mm -hmm. wait for the opportunity to present itself and Mm -hmm. you have to be ready 
Amen. No, I feel like that is a perfect example of the discipline that you have, right? And I feel like sports, playing football, playing, you know, especially you playing professional sports, I mean, you had a crazy amount of discipline that I'm sure family instilled as you instilled in you as well. Um, and, and that's awesome to hear. Um, I kind of want to go back to, you know, when you got to the NFL, right? And I, and I think I saw you post something and I saw an article about it as well. You know, it said, I think it was a Sports Illustrated article, it said something like for many, you know, football stars, four out of five former NFL players go bankrupt or suffer severe financial distress within, it was like two years of retirement, right? Four out of five NFL football players go bankrupt or, or reach severe financial distress within two years of retirement. That's insane to me. Like that isn't even how, like, I can't even grasp how that happens. I, I kind of think it's just like, okay, the more money you make, the more money you spend type of thing. And you just spend so much not knowing where your money's going. But what did you see in the NFL uh, in regards to that? Yeah. Is that, I were think, you actually seeing that? Yeah, uh, definitely. Definitely. Um, You know, I, I like to kind of say that you're always going to be a product of your environment to some degree, right? So a lot of uh, NFL players are unfortunately people of color, right? And uh, in our background, finance is not something that's um, uh, number one, right? In in our category, right? We haven't been educated. Um, we have historically not been able to uh, capitalize on um, economic development and financial growth. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of times when someone comes into money with no education or experience, you know, they start purchasing things that they likely have always wanted when they were a kid. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a saying that says like a fool in their money, you know, with no education is, is part of it or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I've experienced people in the NFL or past, you know, players that I've played with spend money on cars and, you know, houses and, and trips. Um, and the good thing I think is that, you know, in today's modern day athlete, I think the modern day athlete today is, is different than what it used to be 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, we saw the broke, you know, 10 plus years ago, we saw the 30 for 30 broke of athletes kind of spending money and, and spending it on lavish things. But I think in today's environment, the modern day athlete is totally different, right? Because the image of the athlete is totally different. When I say the image of the athlete, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the LeBron James the, the Kobe Bryant, the Tom Brady, um, other athletes that are doing business and being more financially astute with their capital hmm. as opposed to what it used to be. Um, so I think the positive light of moving forward is that, you know, athletes are, are smarter now. They are more in tune with their financial, uh, you know, bandwidth of what they want to do and what they can do. And I think the light is is going to be positive moving forward. Um, unfortunately, there are things out there and people out there that are still bad actors in the space and targeting athletes. And we see still see those those clips out there that, you know, such and such is, is investing with this financial advisor. And the thing about athletic space is that it's a, it's, it's a fraternity, right? So a lot of guys do business with the same guys. So one person might refer one athlete to a financial advisor and he does the same to his next locker made and so on and so forth. And now you have five to 10 people that have been investing with the same person hmm. and are all in this financial scam. Um, but I think the education part, you know, as, as I mentioned, is something that is going to be more prevalent when you think about finance and the professional athletes and their ability to retain their wealth. Um, it's just going to take some time like anything. So. Hmm. No, good point. Um, I, I do feel like a lot of the stories you hear are, from, you know, financial advisors taking advantage of athletes or people buying, you know, expensive cars and rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. But I do feel like the change is happening, like you said, and I feel like it's the combination of, you know, athletes, you know, hearing those type of conversations about money and also the idea and the fact that you can also make money off your name and your image and your likeness now, right? Whereas, you know, if you're an athlete in today's society, all it takes is a a post on Instagram, you know, to start making yeah. some money coming in. Right. And it's, so it's really like, 
you can not only just profit on the field now, but you can profit off the field just by being an NFL athlete, obviously having a brand and, you know, building something to, 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 to give to other people. But I do think the landscape is changing. It's, 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 it's super interesting. What's your opinion on the NIL and college football? Um, I don't know too much about it in depth, <laughs> but I would say I'm all for it because um, there were, there, you know, I can remember my, my first year when I walked on at Maryland, you know, this was, it's like 2012 or something like that. You know, I wasn't allowed to eat at the cafeteria. So like we've came a long way. Um, what do you mean you weren't now, allowed to eat at a cafeteria? Yeah. So back, back then when you weren't on scholarship, you weren't allowed to eat with the, uh, with the team because that's the scholarship folks that were eating in the dining hall. So that, you know, we had our own dining hall at the facility and after practice, we had to go to the, um, call it the, the you know the, the general population you know student demographic dining hall to use our swipes to eat after after our practice so it's it's different now but but you know to your point of nil i'm all for uh, college athletes getting paid because you've seen it all the time you know uh pictures that we're taking you know before the 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 season that's being promoted on a bunch of magazines and all of a sudden you got your faces lit up in a nice uh you know billboard in front of campus and you're not yep. being compensated for that marketing i mean all of that is money that can be funneled to the athlete back to their parents or something like that right when i was growing up sorry when i was in college you know half of my pell grant money was going back to my mom mm -hmm. right to to make sure that she has some money to pay some bills right so i'm all for college mm -hmm. athletes getting paid i'm all for the the transfer portal i'm all for the independence because too long historically have college athletes been shackled with um, not being able to get paid, not being able to transfer. Um, mm. And I think now it's kind of like the, the wild, wild west. And rightfully so, because coaches do it all the time. Coaches leave all the time, you know? And so now with the roles of reverse, you know, they're upset. So I'm going to get off my soapbox about that. But <laughs> I'm all for, uh, for athletes getting paid. Yeah. I think, I think it's still finding it's uh it, it's it's uh it's still finding it's it's landing right now right and we're still trying to figure it out but i think uh it's a phenomenal opportunity for guys especially like you said we're trying to give money to their family or you know mom back at home just trying to pay rent i mean that's a i mean they're making so much money off your name i mean at least you could do is make some money to you know to for yourself you know and i think it's a it's a it's a good opportunity um yannick so i mean you're a smart guy you know, you're a very smart guy. You're a very knowledgeable guy. You're in the business world. Uh, you're working in real estate, you know, have your own private equity firm. Like, where did that mindset come, you know, to jump into the business world? Have you always had that mindset with you, even when you were a kid playing football all the way to the NFL? Or was that, like, was that established, you know, when you were leaving? Because a lot of people, you know, that I went to school with, a lot of people that, that I know, it's like, we don't even have the capability to know something like that exists, right? So like how, where does that mindset come from to jump into this? And we're going to talk a little bit more about real estate after this, but I want to know like, how did you have that mindset to even know that this thing was out there? And then, you know, what, how did you attain that? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, uh, you know, for, I think from starting, from, from reading the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, definitely, you know, sparked the thought in my head. Then I landed on bigger pockets. Um, then I landed on multifamily investing and why that's great and that why that's scalable as opposed to single family. Um, but but for me, you know, honestly, I wanted to create I wanted to to create generational wealth. I wanted to have the same freedom um, that I had to some degree while I was playing sports. Um, I didn't want to go work for a job and be you know tied to a desk nine to five for the rest of my life. Um, because I felt like life was kind of too short for that. And I quite frankly enjoyed my freedom mm. of just like traveling when I wanted to and, and swiping the card and not having to think about it. You know, um, I'm, I think everyone deserves that opportunity to do so in life. And another thing too, was just, um, you know, creating an impact that you can be remembered for. And I think that real estate is a great opportunity to do so. Um, not necessarily only on just generational wealth and, and passing it down to generations and generations and generations, but being able to have an impact on someone else's life and, and creating a community and helping the community as well. And having those kind of, um, those, those sideways, uh, impact funnels, so to speak, that you can help other people. You know, we've, mm -hmm. 
housed people that um, were homeless and were, were in a homeless shelter. Um, we've, we've housed people that were in the projects and, and, um, and, and, and putting, putting those tenants in, in homes where they can be in neighborhoods where their kids can uh, get better education, right? And now they're surrounded by uh, a better crowd and now they likely can be a doctor or a lawyer now, right? So I think mm. um, I really love real estate because of the double bottom I, and that's income and impact, right? Creating generational wealth, but then also impacting your community. So bam, you know, you said bigger pockets, rich dad, poor dad, learning about multifamily investing. It's one thing to learn about it. What were those actionable steps that you took to actually make that a reality for you? Yeah. So I think studying, studying the game is, is, is definitely one of the, one of the things that I did. Right. So um, I kind of liken it to like creating a playbook, right. Figuring out like what other people are doing, starting with your strategy, working behind when well, working from that um, creating a playbook of like, how to get to that level. And obviously, you know, there's no uh, uh, kind of guy that's just out there, just sitting there where you, you kind of have to develop it yourself, right? Because mm. you, you know what you want to do, um, but you don't know how to get there. So surrounding yourself with people who have done it before, taking some things, going back to your playbook, jotting some things down, talking to more and more people, and success always leaves clues, right? Mm. And I'd rather follow someone else who has done it before um, and just kind of model success, not necessarily replicate, and not necessarily um, um, try to you know reinvent the wheel, right? Just model success and figuring out like, all right, how did this person get to where I want to be? How did this person get to where I want to be? You know, what things have, you know, what challenges did, did they incur? What challenges did this other person occur? just kind of work from there and kind of build a playbook and you're never going to have it, you know, all said and done. And then, you know, you, you feel like you need to start. The key is just to take action mm. because the way that the universe works is that when you take action, things start to fall in place or things start to move in the direction of where you want to be. Right. Um, the energy starts to attract those magnetic fields start to attract and you start attracting what, where you're trying to get to. Right. So for example, you know, we have a podcast as well. You know, we uh, provide educational information um, and through, through those funnels, an investor might come in and say, Hey, I like what you're doing. We want to invest with you. You know, we want to invest in some of your projects. Right. Um, so I think the thing is, the thing is just like take action, right. Hmm. Figure out, where you want to be, find people who have done it before, learn from them, ask them questions, build your own playbook and just start taking action. And I think over time, you're going to start getting the results that you want to get. Wow, that's golden right there. That's golden. I feel like when I looked at this past year too, you know, of my life, I feel like where I wasted the most amount of time was in that planning stage, right? Because, mm. you know, I have a vision of what I want my life to look like. I have a vision of how I want to get properties and have a vision, but I was doing too much of vision, 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 and not enough acting, action, act, sorry, acting. Yeah. Acting it out. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's something that we all fall victim to is being on YouTube university and then not actually applying the information that we've learned. Right. And, and kudos to you. Cause I feel like you know, it definitely takes courage to say, hey, I'm not going to actually act now, but only a few amount of people actually do. You know, how many people do you meet that are saying, you know, it's 2023 and they say, hey, Yannick, you know, I want to get into real estate. I'm going to start investing. 2025, same person. Hey, Yannick, you know, I, I, I want to get I want to get into investing. You know, 2030, they're still trying to get into investing. Right. And it's, it's crazy because I think the thing is, from what I realize is you feel like you need something to take that next step. You know, I feel like I need, you know, $50,000, then I'll go. You know, I feel like I need to yeah. know exactly what a cap rate is, then I'll go. You know, I think I need to go find, you know, a lender uh, who's going to give me this, you know, rate, and then I'll move forward. But the whole time is, like you said, it's, it's just connecting with people. It's, it's literally just putting it out there, telling somebody what you want to do and just saying, hey, let's work together. And I think that's the one yeah. thing. Let's work together. Let's do this together, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I think I, that's very, I, go ahead. No, I'm sorry to cut you off. I, you know, I was, I was going to say, you know, I, I think that's, um, 
you know, a lot of times we can get stuck in analysis paralysis. And, you know, you strike me as someone who likes to uh, be curated in their approach um, and not necessarily do too much movement without progress. And I think part of that, you know, in, in, in my journey as well, is that um, sometimes you're going to, that's just part of, part of the, of getting over the hump, right. Is, is doing a lot of movement with no progress because you have to do something to figure out if you're doing the right thing. Like mm -hmm. you'll never figure out if you're doing the right thing, if you're not doing anything. Um, the key is that you want to figure out that you want to do, you want to figure out that you're doing the right thing as quickly as possible. That's the, that's kind of like the, I think the hardest part where people get stuck at between taking action and not taking action is that um, they want all this information to make sure that you're doing it right. But the, the fact of the matter is that you're never going to figure it out, you know, on the onset, right? You just got to figure it out as you go on. You know, mm -hmm. we're still figuring things out, right? We're no by no means per perfect, even though we've uh, been able to, you know, uh, you know, build a portfolio and 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 um, you know, raise capital for our projects. Uh, but the thing is, like, just take action. And and over time, if you kind of have that accountability uh, with yourself, you know, maybe it's a weekly check in, maybe it's a monthly check in, mm -hmm. uh, to really sit back and analyze, like does this feel like I'm going in the right direction? Am I getting the progress that will lead to that result? I think action is the best um, solution to um, a lot of problems. No. You're taking, taking those steps, you know, actually getting out of analysis paralysis and, and being brave enough to, to actually take those steps. It's funny because once I knew that, you know, my NFL dream was kind of coming to an end, um, the first thing that I did was jump into commercial real estate. Um, I had, uh, you know, a, a colleague of mine who worked at, you know, a brokerage and I jumped full steam ahead in it. But the mindset that I had was one that was, let's get my property and let's get owning as fast as possible. Like I was just, I want to own properties. I want to own properties. And I didn't realize just how long it takes to own a property. Uh, and I didn't realize all the things that go into it. You know, it's not something that happens overnight. And I looked at myself and I looked at uh, just where I was at and, and, and being in brokerage and, you know, going through all the struggles that a broker goes through. You know, I told myself, if, if I want to own real estate, you know, what is truly the best path to get there? Um, and. And I, and I determined that it wasn't, it wasn't in brokerage for me. You know, for me, it was, hey, let's go find a job where I can save some money because how am I going to invest in real estate if I don't have a savings account? And, you know, I started to look at the long-term focus just as much as the short-term focus and kind of reevaluate my plan for how I was going to own real estate and, uh, and kind of just pivoted, right? I made a pivot. Yeah. Um, and so I guess the question that I'm going to ask you is what, first off, what is the best path to owning real estate? And what is your advice on someone trying to get, you know, their first property, their second property, or just get, yeah. you know, get that money in there? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, well to, to start off, you know, what, what you're doing is the same thing that I did as well, because I, I realized that brokerage was not for me. I wanted to be on the investment side. And I, I started off commercial brokerage and then went to asset management working for someone else because I found that I found that that was a better use of my time hmm. and would also give the additional uh, credit backing to uh, buy more properties at scale. Um, so just wanted to, to, to start off with that. But, you know, for, for, for me, um, what I think the, the easiest way for someone to get their first property is just their first home, right? Because you can get a down payment on an FHA loan at three and a half percent, you know, potentially get a multi-unit, two to four unit property, live in one unit, rent the other ones out. I did the same thing for my first, first, very first rental property. And I, I still own that property today. You know, I cash flow at least a thousand a month net off of that property. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the, that's the first, that's the, the, the best way for someone to get in because you can get in at a relatively lower down payment as opposed to just buying, you know, property at 25% down. So that's the first thing. That's the easiest way for someone to, I think, own a property with, with, you know, while they have a job. Right. Um, I think your second question was to, to, to scale up and, and, you know, buy more properties. Um, 
I think before we, gonna... before we get there, yeah. Yannick, because, you know, obviously the people who are listening to this, they're probably, this might be going over their head, right? So let's yeah. just back it up, uh, kind of make it more basic. Why scale and why buy investment properties from yeah. the basics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think scaling depends on how you want to how you want to run your real estate business, right? So either you scale through, and this is my this is my honest opinion from like playing in both 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 fields, right? You know, we're focused on the private equity space. You know, we start off in single family. I think that if you want to scale in a way that you can buy larger and larger deals, you're obviously going to need to raise more and more capital, right? Unless you have the capital yourself. Um, and that arguably is more challenging than just doing deals 100% on your own and just maybe playing in a single family space or working up and doing your own, you know, maybe smaller multifamily deals until you've amassed maybe millions of dollars of capital to go and put it down on a $10 million building, right? Um, I think the scaling part just depends on how you want to operate your own real estate business. And so I think that's between you and yourself to really think about in terms of how big do you want to be and how much, how many you know people do you want to manage? Because it takes a lot of people to, to, to operate a private equity, you know, business. If you're the lead operator, right. You know, there's uh there's a, there's an admin part to it. You know, you, you got to pay people, uh, you need to do the marketing. Um, you need to do the asset management. Somebody has to underwrite deals. You know, and this is about, what this is what Maryland acquisitions is right now. Right? Yeah, you're doing yeah. all these aspects of raising money for real estate, and then you're deploying that capital into buying, you know, apartment buildings. And then everybody yeah. who has gave you money, you're giving them a return on their money, while you're yes. also owning the asset. Right. That's essentially what Maryland yes. acquisitions is doing. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think it, it just depends on you know how big do you want to scale. Um, and I forget your second question. Uh, the second question is, is why scale, right? So, and I asked that yeah. question, Yannick, because so for me, my goal, at least right now, my 23 year old self, obviously goals change, but my goal is to own real estate to where it can cover my basic expenses, right? So I want my real estate to cover my, my rent, my insurance, my phone bill, um, all my other expenses, right? And I want real estate to cover that, right? So if I needed to, I could literally not have to work and just have my my real estate cover my my basic expenses. Obviously, I want to grow that that money, but how do we how do I get there, or how do we get there to where like we can have money coming in each month to where it covers our basic expenses? Yeah, I think it's it's just about you know to your point about about scaling, right? You know, one property probably isn't going to do it for you, but maybe five to ten properties is going to do it for you, right? So I think you know. On the, on the smaller level, you know, we've used a mixture between cash and business credit to, you know, uh, purchase more properties, rehab them, refinance them, and just uh, cash flow those rentals. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it just you really have to figure out, all right, what's your freedom number, right? Is it 5,000 a month? Is it 3,000? When I say freedom number, meaning that you have freedom some number. sort of, you know, ancillary income or, or passive, so to speak, income to, um, to, to fill those, that ex, those, those expenses, your monthly expenses, right? That's kind of like your, your freedom number and figuring out, you know, all right, you know, how many properties do I need and how can I acquire those? And I, you know, I gave a real life example of just using a mixture between cash and business credit to, you know, maybe buy the properties cash and utilize business credit to, to start the rehab or getting a construction loan to start to start the rehab and just use it, utilizing the birth strategy, right? That's a great strategy to kind of recycle your money, to do more and more projects. Um, so I think that's one side to do, you know, on the, on the kind of like the smaller single family, you know, side. And then, you know, on the larger scale, you obviously have to understand the importance of raising capital, right? Because if you don't have the money, you can't scale. That's just any business, not just real estate. It can be, you know, tech or whatever the case may be. Um, money is needed for the most part to scale. Mm -hmm. And so if you focus on the money aspect, I think that is, 75 percent of the of the battles right because the reason that i say that is that um the money comes first before the deal if you if you if you find a deal and you can't find the money there's 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 nothing right hmm. but if i if i have the money 
I'm, it's more likely that I can find a deal because the reason, the reason I'm saying this, to you, right? exactly. People are more willing to talk to you. You know, if I go into a room, a meetup event and say, you know, I'm looking for deals, you know, it might get, you know, a couple of responses, but if I go to a meetup event and say, Hey, um, you know, I have a million dollars to deploy and I need to deploy this capital who has deals. I guarantee that I'll probably get a hundred <laughs> emails in my inbox the following day. Right. So if you focus on figuring out a way how to find the capital, the deals would come. And I think this industry has a way of reversing that in, in, in a way that, you know, is, is somewhat misleading of saying like, Oh, if you find a good deal, the money would come. That's, that's the, probably the biggest myth and the biggest right. way to set yourself up for, for failure. Hmm. You know, you, when you first start, you figure out how can you find the money first? Because that's the that's your biggest hindrance to scaling, in my opinion, any business is, is the money aspect. So um, I think that's the best way for for people to scale, small or large. Hmm. No, that's a that's a great answer. Um, I feel like <clears throat> broad broadly speaking, you know, we think of you know I think of times I raise money. You know, I convinced my mom to give me some money for a pair of new shoes, right? That's like very, very basic instinctual, you know, asking your parents for money, what you're saying to them to convince them to give you that $20 for Chipotle with you and your friends or go to the movies. High level, though, I mean, you're talking to executives, you're talking to other principals, you know, I even think about Think Gold, you know, I, I want to turn this into a, to a company, a media company where I'm, you know, raising funds to be able to give out to, you know, initiatives to, to raise money for the homeless and stuff like that. Like, how do you get to a point where you can convince someone to give you money uh, and how, do, how does like, how do you, how do you do that? Yeah. So I think the, the biggest thing is allowing pe allowing people to like, know, and trust you, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the biggest thing out of that first and foremost is they have to know you because if they don't know you, they can't get an opportunity to like you and then hopefully get an opportunity to trust you with their money. So it's like, Either you're going to either you have the network behind you that, you know, maybe an, an Uncle Sam or Uncle Joe or something like that, that has a couple million bucks to, to fund your, your real estate empire. Or you you have to go out there and just talk to people and, and get people to to know who you are and spread a message. And hopefully that your message resonates with someone to where you're, you're now like minded and you give them the opportunity to like you. And now they trust you with their capital. You know, we've been able to uh, reach out to. Um, you know, through different channels of podcasting and, and our blogs and content and things of that nature, reach out to people that we probably wouldn't have been able to reach. And, you know, they've invested in our capital, whether it's, uh, you know, Clubhouse, whether it's, um, you know, uh, LinkedIn. You on Twitter um, spaces yet? Yeah, we're, we're not on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Nah, you got to get on Twitter, man. You lost yeah. some great things with Twitter. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's just, People have to like, know, and trust you, right? But the first thing is you have to know people, right? So if you focus on getting your message out, networking, shaking hands, and 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 finding people, you you you'll put yourself in more of an opportunity to to get more invested capital. Hmm. I think if I had to add anything to that, I'd just also say got to know your shit, right? Yeah, that's where that that YouTube University comes in. Once you've done the actionable steps and you put yourself in that room. Now you got to know what you're talking about, especially in a space like real estate, right? Yeah. Where, um, but that's the thing about real estate. You know, if you know what you're talking about and, you know, you've, you've done deals before and it's worked, I mean, people are going to flock to you, right? People are going to, yeah. you're going to have a, you know, a gravitational pool uh, for people wanting to place their money. Cause there's a lot of, you know, people who are just sitting on tons of money right now, not knowing where to put it. So, you know, I think that yeah. that is, um, always upside with people like you in, in your position. Um, so yeah, yeah, last section of the podcast here, Yannick, and I really appreciate you touching on, on real estate. I want a couple more questions. I want to ask you about real estate, kind of like some short uh, topics here. Call this section rapid fire, right? So I'm going to just ask you some, some rapid fire questions. What is cash flow in real estate? Yeah. So cash flow is essentially um, the net income that you have after your gross income, you know, the top rents that maybe your tenant is paying, maybe they're paying you 1200, you know, bucks a month, then maybe you have, you know, $500 or $600 in expenses and everything below that. Um, after you pay the mortgage, that might be, I don't know, maybe, you know, 300 bucks a month, you know, 
that remainder is what you call, you know, your free cash flow, right? After your mortgage is paid, all of your expenses are accounted for or escrowed. Um, and then that bottom line is essentially your cash flow, which I think is the is the best route to financial freedom. Because if you have that cash flow that you can just dip into and take a trip to Miami or um, you know, go out with your 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 significant other, um, that's really what life is about to me. Hmm. What is appreciation? So appreciation essentially, you know, can probably be broken down into two different aspects. So uh, market appreciation, which um, pretty much is, you know, market driven, right? You have maybe uh, low interest rates that can, uh, you know, spur uh, investment into a community. And now the, the, the property value goes up, you know, that's kind of, you know, what we call market appreciation. And then there's forced appreciation through the Burr method that I mentioned earlier on was by, you know, buying a dilapidated property for maybe 50,000, 100,000, you know, putting another 100,000 in it. And now the property is worth maybe like 350 or so, you know, that's forced appreciation. So um, that's the method that we enjoy because we can control it. And uh, market appreciation to us is really just icing on the cake. What is the most important attribute in being a successful real estate investor? Um, That's a good question. That's a good question because I feel like there's, there's so many attributes. Um, I, I think the most successful attribute is, is this feeling of you have to like know how to persevere and be resilient mm. because the world of real estate relies, you know, if you're just buying a retail property stabilized, you know, it doesn't need any work. You just buy it and try to collect cash flow, put a property manager on it. That's kind of easy, right? <laughs> I mean, the, pro- the work is already done for you. It's kind of catered to you, gift wrapped in a bow. You just kind of park your money away and have someone else have someone else manage it for you. But if you're like actually doing renovations and value add and raising capital and and construction and all of those things, uh, there's a lot that kind of like, you know, those forces that kind of go against you, whether it's a contractor that's, you know, um, going bad or or the capital markets shift on you and now your deal doesn't pencil or, you know, uh, the, the public entities, you know, governments, you know, that oppose your project. You really have to have that like resilience factor to it, especially in the world of private equity. I feel like because a lot of your success is somewhat um, dependent on uh, others. Whereas, um, you know, when, when I say that from maybe from a capital raising perspective, right, because if you're not able to raise the capital, you can't scale in private equity. So I say that to say uh, perseverance is probably the best trait that you can have to be successful in the world of real estate, because there are just so many things that can go against you. And also it's a high risk industry. Right. So if you know how to manage your risk, if you know how to persevere, you know, through troubling times, you can certainly be successful in the real estate space. Hmm, great answer. Okay. Last one. If you only had $5,000 to start a real estate portfolio, where would you invest it and why? Or how would you invest it and why? Yeah. Uh, I would probably say I would start off wholesaling. I'd probably say I would start off wholesaling. Now that's dependent on your growth, right? And where you really want to be. Uh, because you know there are three parts to a real estate deal. It's the money, the deal, and the experience. So you know, if you wanted to start off in the world of multifamily investing and you have $5,000, you probably want to find a deal, find a good deal, right? Uh, If you wanted to fix and flip, you know, you probably want to find a good deal too as well, right? If you wanted to wholesale, that's probably much easier because you don't need the amount of capital that you need to flip a house. Um, You don't need the amount of capital that you need to buy a building or a hundred unit property. Wholesaling is just, straight up hustle and grind, right? There are things out there, whether it's like in a newspaper or, um, you know, lists that you can pull online or things that you can get from the courthouse or uh, probate leads that you can get. And I've seen a lot of people start off their real estate empire wholesaling because you're only one deal away in this business. I've seen people that made $100,000 on one wholesale fee and now they're off to the races. They got a portfolio now, wow. right? So I think, I think start off by, figuring out like, what's that end goal in mind, right? And then kind of working back from there and then just tie that back to what resources that you do you have. And I think using that, you know, methodology would really kind of point you in the, in the direction that's 
more practical to get to that end result. Wow, profound answer right there. Last question for me, I just added on here. What is your ultimate vision and where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Yeah, so our, our ultimate vision is to um, create a, a $5 billion revolving um, portfolio in the commercial real estate space, private equity, where we're focused on institutional and retail capital. Um, and then part of that too is just also doing community-based investments. So it's affordable housing, uh, building up a community using different tax credit sources, um, public-private partnerships to build communities, uh, because that's a, a big goal of mine, right, is to create an impact, not, on, not necessarily only make money from real estate, but also create an impact, whereas uh, my goal is to, to, to get a statue, right? I mean, if you think about it, like, the greats, like if you think not about the, people not the, who are not, his... not the Martin Luther King statue, though. No, right? no, no, in, in not Boston. that, not that statue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to get a, a, a someone assigned to 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 build that statue in my okay, will or good. something. Good. Um, but I, I think you know, creating a legacy is is something that's really really important to me. You know, and you mentioned that I'm the first generation uh, person to, to 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 come and do it at a high level in in in, in the U.S. and and that's really important to me because, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's the spirits that's telling me like, I'm, I'm the chosen one, right. To mm. create something that is long lasting. You think about like the Rockefellers, right. And now how they have generational wealth, right. I'm essentially the Rockefeller of my family. You know, mm. you are essentially the Rockefeller of your family. So it's up to you and up to us to, to make sure that, you know, when that time comes, you know, cause it's going to come for everyone, right. When that time comes that you've left this earth or left your family with something that you can be remembered for, for generations to come. So, and that's why I really love real estate is, you know, like I mentioned, the, the income and the impact aspects to it. Hmm. Wow. That was profound, man. That was profound. Um, appreciate you coming on the podcast, Yannick. Really thank you for your time. Obviously everyone listening to this can tell why you're thinking gold, you know, why you're someone who embodies that mindset. It was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Real quick, where can the people find you? Uh, okay, I also want to plug in your podcast, The Real Estate Mogul, right? It's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, pretty sure on all podcast platforms. Uh, this is something I saw on LinkedIn that was trending. Yannick is literally interviewing people uh, you know, on the top of the ladder in real estate. And it's a, it's a great platform to where you guys can learn about wholesaling, You know, some of the terms he mentioned, cash flow appreciation, really a good avenue for anybody listening to this to uh, go tune into the Real Estate Mogul podcast with Yannick Cujo Virgil. Now, where can the people find you, Yannick? Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned the podcast, um, the Mogul Marathon Real Estate Podcast. And, um, you know, our website is called Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N-N, acquisitions with an S dot com. We have a bunch of different resources, a syndication guide for passive investors, a due diligence guide for, for people who are interested in learning about due diligence on multifamily assets and a bunch of more different blogs. So um, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. And this was really uh, enjoyable. Yes, sir. Yannick, well, take care. Thank gold. Enjoy your Sunday, man.